friends, how are you? It's nice to have you all here. Great to have you, former students and, and colleagues. And uh, I know we have a number of technicians in the audience, and it's great to have you all here. Um, can I ask uh, how many of you already use dexmedetomidine in your programs? Oh, quite a few. OK. So with that in mind, then, what I'd like to do is during the, the presentation, feel free to please go ahead and just take me off on tangents with questions that you'll have. Because I think if most of you already use this, you probably have particular issues that you want answered. If we save those to the end, then we may not get to them. And hopefully, we'll go off on tangents that are useful for everybody, too. So I know um, I, I speak a lot about this topic because dexmedetomidine is a drug that um, we use in shelter situations and in practice, whether it's specialty hospital or whether it's general practice situations. And it's a tool that I think has become increasingly more useful for a lot of our spay and neuter populations, whether they be practice, specialty even, and certainly shelter organizations. People ask all the time, you know, where do I learn more about this? There's several good um, options for this. And probably the biggest one, the Shelter Vet website has many protocols on there that use these. Um, there's a couple good articles. And if you just Google the name Co, Jeff Co, he's a colleague of mine. He's also an anesthesiologist at Purdue. Did a lot of the studies on this. The IVIS site, IVIS.org, many of you may not know about that, but that's International Veterinary Information Society. It's a free site. And some of the colleagues at the college here started this many, many years ago. Um, you register on that, but it's an unbelievable plethora of textbooks and articles that are really of great interest and unattainable through other ways. So if you don't have academic means to get articles or chapters of books, they're free on this site. Um, so it's a really great thing. And certainly, Pfizer and Zoetis are the, is the company, uh, formerly Pfizer, now known as Zoetis, makes dexmedetomidine. And your representative in your area, just a wealth of information on this drug. What I'm going to do is just talk about some essential features of the shelter program today. I'm going to talk about some general anesthesia considerations in the shelter world. And then we'll get on to the drug itself. So just to start out, any anesthesia protocol we use, whether it includes dexmedetomidine or it doesn't, really should give us four or five essential things. It should calm the animal. It should give pain relief. It should relax it enough that it makes the animal immobile so we can work on it. Um, control is unfortunately a big part of our anesthesia versus human anesthesia. And immobilize safely is really a key, because what we want to do is reduce central nervous system function but we want to do so to the point that it is reversible and without permanent impairment. Yeah, so really that safe reversal is a key for our features that we don't have a good outcomes analysis on. In people, they know if they reduce the central nervous system function safely because people, if they wake up disoriented or unable to write, read, know the number two, see what's in front of them, we, they have problems. They know that the isoflurane and the sevoflurane have been too high. We don't have a way to, to recognize that. Our animals don't have to go home and cook dinner, drive a car, write a book, help the kids with homework. So we just count on the fact that these drugs are providing something essential and we're doing it safely. Um, in terms of one other key protocol uh, feature that all anesthesia should have is amnesia, the ability to make the individual undergoing anesthesia have not a bad recollection or no recollection of what's going on. Now in people, there's two classes of drugs that do that. The first is the benzodiazepines, and many of you will know that from Valium, midazolam, or lorazepam. Those are the drugs. And the other group is the drugs that include dexmedetomidine. They're called alpha agonist drugs. In shelter medicine and trap neuter release, feral animal anesthesia, we really want to not only include those features, but we also want the protocol to be low cost, very efficient, safe to the staff, especially because so many levels of staff are involved, safe for the patient, and really allow for low controlled substance usage and low equipment if possible. 
And the reason that we don't like a lot of equipment, i.e. anesthesia machines, it looks like something solid, something really predictable, but you know what? All the ins and outs of that machine can be so easily, easily faltered. And I say that from little one-way valve problems to the rebreathing circuit, to the soda sodasorb, to the vaporizer, to the oxygen flow meter. Many of you may not know this, especially if you're in a mobile relief um, clinic, but tilting your vaporizer, depending on what kind of vaporizer you have, will increase or decrease its output by up to 30 to 50 percent. So when you think you have isoflurane on two, you could have it on three to five, who knows, if your machine tilted one way or the other. So those are the things we're trying to avoid. In terms of our patients, the quality of care around anesthesia um, in a practice situation is usually extremely good, but it's time consuming because it involves pre-medding, putting an IV in, catheter in, pre-oxygening the animal, giving an induction agent, hooking them up to the machine. It's expensive, it's tailored to the individual. We just don't have that time in the shelter world. In terms of our success of anesthesia for the patient, much of this success for the patient immediately, meaning getting through anesthesia, and for the program overall, is really due to the comfort of the staff with whatever tools they use. So if you even use a drug like acepromazine, if you're comfortable with using that, and you feel like, oh, I know this drug, I know I can reduce the dosage a little, you're going to have good success with that drug. Okay? Even though it's an older drug, and classically it's an all or none type of drug. It has a much to do with the care of the animals perioperatively. And what do we mean by that? If we go ahead and make sure that only the healthier animals go to surgery. And in a shelter situation, you know, probably about 50 to 60 percent of them may not be that healthy. It doesn't mean they don't go to surgery. It just means that we try to get them better quality going into surgery so that they have better quality coming out. Junk in, junk out. If we send an animal that has snotty nose and can't really breathe into surgery, you know what? We've induced shock with anesthesia and with surgery. So guess what they are going to have coming out of anesthesia? Really crappy recovery and a bad day afterwards. So we can really improve that by getting that animal cleared up a little bit and then taking them into spay or neuter. Um, certainly keeping the equipment and the warmth on the animals. Patients drop temperature during anesthesia, so keeping them warm. Um, deciding which type of technique to do and making it quick. And then the flow of the day's cases. In terms of the overall long-term success of the patient, though, and this is where I think shelters have a huge window of opportunity, is it's not only about the care of the animals perioperatively, it's about which drugs we use. And it's about how we adjust those doses. And I'm not asking you to adjust them for every patient, but there may be 5% of the case, day's cases that really need a different little modification of their protocol. And when I say long-term success of anesthesia, what we're talking about is not getting the animal through surgery. We're talking about whether they're going to have a problem a week, a month, six months to a year down the line, i.e. valvular disease, early kidney failure, pancreatitis, cystitis, probably the bigger things we're thinking about. Something like cystitis, people used to think no relation to anesthesia. What we found in both human and veterinary medicine is that if we use atropine and glycopyrrolate in our protocol, we're predisposing those patients probably to cystitis. Okay? We dry up a lot of their secretions, and some of those essential secretions, lacrimal, pancreatic, GI, bladder. Okay? We know we dry up saliva. That's sometimes why people like it but we don't know that it adds to the long-term stability of that patient. So those are the things that we really try to improve. And towards that end, if we can reduce two important parts of anesthesia, two very dangerous important parts of anesthesia, i.e. inducing anesthesia and gas, isoflurane, SIBO, they call them inhalant agents. If we can reduce them to the most efficient for the patient, the least vaporizer setting, the least volume of induction agent. Okay, I'm not asking you to get rid of them, but if we can reduce them to the minimal, we can help not only the immediate success of the patient, but the long-term success of that, of that anesthesia and the health of that patient. Okay? Now, in a shelter situation, I'm not sure how much that matters to you because really the goal is to get the animal out of the shelter and into the general population, but what we want is a healthy animal 
going into the population. We don't want them returned. And we don't want the patient, the people to call back and say, oh, this cat has, you know, cyst it's a chronic cystitis case now. I don't know what happened. So try to think about that as we go through the presentation because these are really going to, reducing these agents are going to lessen the morbidity of anesthesia. So general um, ideas about which patients should and shouldn't go to surgery and anesthesia. Anesthesia is basically titrating shock. That's all it is. We take poisons sad as it is, and we try to give those poisons to the point that we get analgesia, pain relief, relaxation, mobil immobility so we can keep the animal still, um, certainly a reduction of central nervous system function, but we want it to be a safe reduction of central nervous system function. We want our brain function to go down, but we also want it to be able to come back up appropriately. And we want, if we can, to include amnesia. In that process, when we give shock to that patient and we titrate these poisons, we of course reduce cardiac output and the oxygen content of the blood. What do we mean by that? We reduce the way the heart pumps and the way oxygen is delivered to the cells. If we feel giving shock to that patient is going to put that patient at risk either immediately or long term, then today's not the right day for surgery. Okay? Stabilize the patient first maybe some sub-Q fluids, maybe some antibiotics, and take it to surgery in the next few days. Okay? It's amazing how something like sub-Q fluids can really improve the cardiovascular status of our patients. So we don't have junk going in, junk coming out. In terms of fasting, things have changed over the past few years. This is part of the perioperative care I was talking about. We now know that neonatal animals, very little fasting. In fact, feed them almost right up to the last minute or an hour, hour and a half before. Pediatric animals, I try to give them something to chew on and lick with either NutriCal or peanut butter, something in that, even baby food. Adult dogs and cats overall in practice and in shelter situations, not longer than four to six hours. Now that's tough because usually animals get done in the morning, we ask people to fast them overnight. And I realize not many people are going to get up at 1 to 2 a.m. and feed the animal. And they're not likely to be hungry anyways. But what that means to us is that when we have an animal going into surgery that has been fasted for a long period of time, that animal is more at risk. Not only for hypoglycemia, which we all know it's easy to fix. We put some NutriCal on their lips. Uh, we put some baby food on their lips. We put k syrup on their lips. That's fine. But what happens in the hypoglycemia is the body starts to react with this surge of hormones. And that surge of hormones, whether it be vasoactive peptide, whether it be norepinephrine, whether it be epinephrine, whether it be serotonin, they create the morbidity around the event. Okay? They vasoconstrict, they allow poor perfusion, they allow high heart rates when they should be low, they allow low heart rates when they should be high. Okay? Those are the, the big things that, that hypoglycemia adds to. So really try to minimally fast animals nowadays. And I know that's a hard concept um, to grasp, but we really are getting away from it. And people, the whole idea of clear liquids up to the time of surgery has almost been um, enlarged to say, take a meal that morning because we want you to have a little something in your stomach. In terms of anesthesia equipment, we all know that keeping things clean is very important and, and difficult in a shelter situation. Um, the caveat that I have to this is it doesn't rely on disinfectant. What it relies on is cleanliness. Cleanliness is different than disinfection. We're not talking about chlorhexidine soak for all our trach tubes. What we're talking about is making sure they're clean with just dishwashing detergent and water. And even more importantly, because we're putting these tubes down a very semi-sterile area of the respiratory tract, rinsing them. Make sure they're rinsed really well. Try to look at the cuffs on your endotracheal tube too. And many of you use these clear endotracheal tubes and they're fantastic um, because you get a bunch of these for free, by the way, from your local hospitals. They open up like the average of two to three per human patient. Ask for the leftovers, okay? Um, the cuffs become crisp and they really scratch. So try to inflate them just a little. Make sure that you go ahead and clean in between those rugged areas. And uh, when you do go ahead and rinse them, rinse them really well. And water's fine. You don't have to use distilled water or sterile water or anything like that. Um, certainly making sure that the insides of your breathing circuits are 
are dried as much as possible. We all know we try to wing them out and you know play the old game outside, um, but really trying to put them in a dry area once or twice a week. For shelter situations, what I like to advocate is having color-coded sets of tracheal tubes and breathing circuits that we rotate in and out every week. Um, this week's a blue set, and next week's a yellow set. Um, and I think that's very important for not only allowing drying, but the, the non-growth of things. Um, in supportive care, heat is probably the most important thing we can give our patients. And I usually say this to my students and to the shelters I work with is, hypothermia is the first domino to fall. When we give any anesthetic drug and shock to our patient, we induce probably a drop of one to two degrees in body temperature. And you wouldn't think that's a lot, but add on some vasodilation and some blood loss and you've got a pretty critical situation. So if you can keep that animal warm through contact heat, through circulating hot air, through putting something underneath them when they contact stainless steel, because most of our patients, especially your younger patients in spay and neuter, lose heat through contact. Immediately when they contact something, it's, it's colder than they are. It's rare that it's body temperature. So heat just travels down that gradient. So putting a simple piece of paper underneath the patient, whether it's newspaper, can retain their heat by about a half to 0.7 degrees. That's amazing because that's a lot for us. Okay, And certainly watching your older heat sources, i.e. heat lamps, electrical heating pads, both of which are not only capable of causing burns, but if you have a high oxygen environment, especially around your anesthesia machine and in a truck, be careful of the electricity, okay? Because it's not uncommon that we have fires occur, and those are really hard to control. Monitoring our patients um, in a high quality, high volume spay neuter environment, you know, I can come up with a lot of different monitors, but really the most important monitors are what I call hands-on or manual monitoring. And it, it makes, it's, it's a part of being a good technician. Really good technician is probably the best monitor we have. And the idea behind that is keeping track of the older things that we know in anesthesia. Jaw tone, um, certainly temperature of the animal. Eye position and pupil size are very, very important. Um, making sure that when an animal becomes recumbent, that their head and neck are extended, that there's as much of an airway as we can give them. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean intubating anymore, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it means monitoring. And when we talk about monitoring too, try not to pay too much attention to any one monitor, but look at trends in the monitoring. Don't look at one variable, but look at what happened a minute ago compared to what's happening now, compared to what happens three to five minutes from now. Because looking at those trends are really more important than looking at the actual variables. And I would urge you guys, if you monitor during anesthesia, many of you will use an ECG, pulse ox. Some of you even use capnography, which is fantastic. They now have on the back of the monitors ways to download these variables into Excel programs so that you as the technician and the veterinarian can be more concerned with actually doing something with the data, not writing it down to prove that, oh, I wrote it down and I was monitoring, but that you can actually take a hold of the animal and deal with it. Um, and at the end of the day, just have everything go into an Excel file to, to show that you are, are watching those trends. So those are pretty common nowadays. In terms of intubating or not intubating, and again, just talking more about the care around anesthesia, this is a trend that's changed over time. We all know that we, we classically, as in preparation for emergencies, have tried to assure that patients have a clear airway. But the downfalls of this are that attaining an animal that has a relaxed open glottis, enough to intubate, requires an extremely deep plane of anesthesia. And it also requires a very talented team of individuals, especially when you're dealing with pediatric and neonatal patients. And so you're more putting more animals at risk if you don't know how to intubate or if you are struggling to intubate than not intubating at all. And in line with that, I think it's where we have to start thinking about more injectable regimes in high volume environments. In terms of our drugs, Trying to get our drug dosages, whether you use dexmedetomidine or things like acepromazine, down to appropriate dilution so that we can get the drug dosages for the tinier patients. We're all, you know, we're into doing earlier spay and neuter. We're trying to get patients done sooner. And these are things that we make up in most practices and in academia now. We take the stock drugs, we dilute them, we keep them for an average of weeks to month. 
on the shelf and it makes really dosing a lot easier than what we call getting a little hub of acepromazine or dexmedetomidine. Question? I do, and I have a slide on that, so it's a really great question. The question was, when you're using a drug combination called Kitty Magic with dexmedetomidine, do you make up a vial of that, say, 100 milligrams of ketamine plus the dexmedetomidine plus telazole, et cetera? We do, and that stock solution can be used for the day or for the week for a number of patients, and that, that is one of the protocols I'll share with you. So any questions about what we talked about so far? Because I'm going to get into talking about more dexmedetomidine now. Um, whether you use dexmedetomidine or not, okay, the anesthesia protocol you, you have depends on a number of things, and sadly, finances are one of them. Dexmedetomidine tends to be one of the more expensive drugs in anesthesia now, but the, the volumes that I'm advocating today, I think, are very much within reach of most shelter situations. And really what we're trying to do is to get a safer protocol for the patients into play, increasing the quality of your care. Because you're going to be held liable to this just like the average practice is in specialty hospital. There's a variety of drugs that are anesthetically used in practice situations. And of all these drugs, we know, that, again, the, the most important things to minimize are our inhalant agents and our induction agents. So drugs such as ketamine propofol, isoflurane, and SIVO. We classically think of as safe because they're quote unquote quick acting, easily injectable. Those are the ones that are most capable of causing those swings in neurotransmitters, vascular perfusion, cardiorespiratory array of signals to the central nervous system, all the things that cause an animal to decline around surgery and within weeks of the event. The alpha agonist drugs are this group of sedative analgesics that act on receptors that we endogenously think about as fight or flight receptors. And alpha agonist drugs include a lot of classic historical drugs. Xylazine is probably the most classic one. Okay, many of you have done this for a long time. Remember that drug when it came out? We started giving a drug, it was marketed as an anesthetic drug. We gave it. And there was a, a certain sad mortality rate that went along with that drug, really sad. But the drug acted on so many fight or flight receptors that modulated cardiac function and not enough that modulated pain relief and healthy, safe sedation. The newer classes of these drugs, the dexmedetomidine and the metatomidine, which is now known as Domator, and many of you might still have that compounded, are different. They act on more of the fight or flight receptors that mediate good things. Pain relief, healthy stress relief, relaxation. They unfortunately still have some cardiac side effects. And many of you who use these know about those. Bradycardia is probably the one of the one events that we think about as most scary, but a lot less than xylazine had. Now, it's not to say that xylazine is a bad drug, and these are good drugs. They all have their disadvantages. Xylazine actually is a very cheap drug nowadays and used in tiny, tiny, tiny volumes mixed appropriately with some of the um, agents we're going to talk about can be used rather safely. Okay, But again, it's probably one of the more ancient agents and considering what we have available nowadays, Dextomator is a big advantage in that. The older literature will show that many of these drugs can be used nicely. Um, Sheila Robertson, um, Julie Levy, many people down at the University of Florida use this nice combination of TKX to go ahead and anesthetize cats and dogs for spay and neuter. There's been some great newer combinations of teletamine, butorphanol, and metatomidine put out in the last few years. And these are actually great agents that have reduced morbidity and mortality in our spay neuter, especially pediatric populations. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is the drug Dextomator and how that might be replacing some of those agents like xylazine and metatomidine in your protocols. So the beauty of Dextomator compared to metatomidine and xylazine is that it is a new generation of these agents 
aimed at minimizing those more severe side effects of bradycardia, vasoconstriction, paleness, um, and maximizing pain relief. Dextomator is the company name for dexmedetomidine. So I'll use the two from here on out synonymously, just so you're aware of that for those of you who haven't heard about that. And how this drug works, we mentioned that it acts on alpha receptors, which are flight or fight receptors in our body. What this drug does is it attaches on to receptors on those nerves that modulate that sympathetic response in us, and it inhibits the release of norepinephrine. That's the overall end result. It's called negative feedback inhibition. And when this happens, first off, we get in our body a little bit of an increased in our sympathetic outflow, hypertension, maybe wide-eyed look, and then with the loss of epinephrine, slowing down. So we get an animal that gets a little bit of a hypertension, wide-eyed look, a little bit of a tachycardia, and then suddenly, done. That's the beauty of this drug and the way that it actually ends up creating a pain-free state, a sedated animal, amnesia in our patients, and great muscle relaxation is through the release, blocked release of norepinephrine. That's the end result. The reversal agent for it, atopamazole, simply gets onto those receptors and elbows the dextomator off and suddenly our norepinephrine levels come back. Okay, many of you have used the reversal agent antecedent to see the change in this drug, know that the animal gets up, they walk off, and it's almost like nothing happened to them. So that, that is the, the pharmacologic means by which we get our physiologic effects, and these are the physiologic effects, the clinical effects we see. We get sedation, and it's profound, because when we reduce our fight or flight hormone, norepinephrine, we get a pretty sedate animal. The pain relief comes from the fact that a lot of those nerves are located in a very specific area of the spinal cord called the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And it's a gray matter area that mediates pain relief. So Dextomator is a great pain reliever. And it works even better, even better, when it's combined with a narcotic. It could be any narcotic whatsoever but the two work synergistically in that area of the spinal cord to wind up the receptor to the point that it takes a little bit of both to get the same effect. Hence, many of these mixes that we had question about earlier, dextomator and torb and ketamine, kitty magic is the name of that, dextomator, teletamine, and hydromorphone or morphine. Um, Along with that, we of course get a decreased heart rate because our norepinephrine is not pushing our heart as much. Um, we also get decreased cardiac output because cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, the volume that the heart pumps. And if we reduce one, of course, we're going to reduce our cardiac output and certainly decrease respiratory rate and effort. So all those are good things to know. The big thing that technicians worry about in practice is that this reflex bradycardia that the drug brings it's profound, okay? It's something different than we're used to in anesthesia. And classically in human and veterinary anesthesia, those of us who were taught 20, 25 years ago, were taught that keep the animal tachycardic. And you know what happened with that? We felt better, guess what happened? The animal was sicker around the time of anesthesia and within weeks to months to come. So within the past decade and a half, there's been a huge rearrangement in our thinking to grasp the idea that bradycardia is good. Whatever we use, whether we use dextomator or a good opioid. Because a very important thing happens in bradycardia. Is there more diastole or more systole in bradycardia? Anyone know? More diastole, more filling when the heart slows. More filling. So the heart volume gets bigger. And then two important things happen when the heart's volume gets bigger. Many veterinarians in this room should know something about the Frank Starling Law. We increase volume, guess what happens? The compression to get it out is much better, which is a great thing. So if we get increased volume in our heart with a slow heart rate, we get a better push out in the vasculature. Another very important thing happens, and this is the reason that dextomator is the drug of choice for us if we get into the cardiac care unit, is our heart muscle perfuses during diastole. 
And the heart is the one muscle that has to keep working all the time. So when we're pushing it with atropine and glycopyrrolate, or you've all seen those large breed dogs with SVT or with atrial fib, heart rate's very high. They're just, they're tired all the time. The heart is not perfusing well. So keep that in mind when you get afraid of bradycardia. And, and classically, it's hard for some technicians to grasp losing dexto or atropine and glycopyrrolate. But that's a reason bradycardia is good. So these are the things that you'll notice when you have a patient in a dextomator anesthetized state. We certainly notice a bradycardia. We have a sudden recumbency in our patient. And unlike the classic ketamine and telazole, that's a stiff type of recumbency, the animals with dextomator just kind of sink and crump. And this is important. I think Jody Gurdon's going to talk to you uh, today, or maybe she already did, about mortality and morbidity during anesthesia. We found that many of these animals that have dextomator become so suddenly recumbent if they're big jowled animals, i.e. pit bulls or your tomcats, they often crump with their head very close to their chest. And that is a great way to obstruct their airway. So once you give an injection of dexmedetomidine, make sure that you're going ahead and clearing that airway so these animals can breathe appropriately. That sudden recumbency is pretty profound, but it allows us a very important thing in, in veterinary anesthesia. And that's if we combine dexmedetomidine with other things, i.e. ketamine, propofol, our opioids, we use a lot less of those very heavy agents. And guess what? Our animals are healthier for it. So the trend is to go ahead and get a steadier plane of anesthesia for us with the use of these agents and use much less induction and maintenance agents. Many of you who still pre-med and use either propofol or ketval to induce your dogs and cats, what you'll find you're not going to be using a lot of propofol and ketval. You'll be using maybe a third, a quarter to a third of the doses you've been using. And you'll also use as much isoflurane and SIVO. And that's better, healthier for the patient. They wake up mentally and cardiovascularly healthier. If they were able to go home and cook dinner, write a book, drive the car, they'd be able to do it. Okay, And certainly, we have a much better recovery in terms of pain relief because dexmedetomidine is a pain reliever. So those are all the goals of using this in our practice. And what I wanted to do is go through some of the more common protocols that are used in the anesthesia world now for dexmedetomidine in shelter classes of patients. This was done by a, a 2012 paper um, combining these drugs in terms of the Dexmed, Butorphanol, and Telazole. And my apologies, there should be a line right between here, OK? Um, two protocols they looked at, looking at different combinations of combining Dexmed, Butorphanol, and Ketamine, or Dexmed, Butorphanol, and Telazole. These drugs were mixed together. They mix very nicely. There are recipes for combining them in one vial if you do a lot of drugs in one day. We get recumbency in seven minutes and about an hour and a half of some really nice surgical sedation and anesthesia. What can you do in this hour and a half? Definitely spay, neuter, OK? You can certainly do tattooing, ear notching, um, you know, your basic dog exam on some of our pre-medicated animals. That's the only way to get a basic dog exam down on some of our more dangerous species. Um, but this is certainly something that you can go ahead and use out in a practice situation. Um, in terms of another combination, dexmedetomidine and ketamine have been combined with hydromorphone or buprenorphine. And the idea behind these, and this was a paper that came out in 2011, is that theoretically, by adding these on board, theoretically only, we should be able to provide better analgesia. Now, in a lab setting where they give this injection and they succumb beagles, lab beagles, to either viscous distension with a balloon, pressure on a limb, toe pinch, maybe with a hemostat, and certainly heat up against their skin, those animals did get more analgesia, better analgesia, when you combined a better opioid with these two than butorphanol. In the real world situation, we haven't really noticed a difference. And I'll tell you why that's the case. 
In a real world situation, we have a lot more of our active hormones going in a stressful situation, i.e. an animal comes in a hospital, they see a doctor, they see a technician, they're starting to think, oh my God, what's gonna happen to me? Epinephrine's going and cortisol's going. And what we've seen is using any combination of this with any one of these, go ahead and give us this recumbency. Ironically, the hydro and buprenorphine groups required more SIVO or SIVOFLURANE in a, a real life situation. And that tells us that they don't provide the practical analgesia that we associate with better opioids. So I think this paper is really key in telling us a couple things. A, we don't have to have a better narcotic with dexmedetomine and ketamine, i.e. buprenorphine, than butorphanol. And B, what we can probably go ahead and count on is keeping the sevoflurane lower or maybe getting it out of the mix if we use butorphanol with dexmed. And an ironic thing that's come out over the past couple years with this combination, dexmed, ketamine, and butorphanol, is that we know butorphanol gives us amazing sedation. And that's not something that hydro and buprenex do. So that's probably where a lot of this comes from. And dexmedetomidine is capable of making some of these drugs better drugs at a receptor level, and butorphanol is one of them. I had a question up here. That's yeah. just what I want to say. Yeah? Sorry. Yeah, could you add anything, Helene, please? No, it's just a sedation. That's what I was going to say, because you were saying Tor gives more sedation than the two other Yeah, have, have you guys found that's true, too? And many of us, you know, years ago, we advocated going to better narcotics because we're thinking theoretically based on the literature, it looks good. But what we weren't looking at is the population that they used in the literature and what the real life situation was. Another question? Dr. Coe talks about uh, it, if you want to use the Buprenex, doing it like 15 minutes before you give the, the cat and dextomator to get a better effect. Do you feel like that's, I mean, to me, it feels like that feels impractical. Yeah, that's the problem. I, I, I think, and if you, were in a, um, if you were in a specialty hospital situation where you had a chance to really work on a patient for three to four hours per patient, I think it will work better. But I don't think buprenorphine is a great drug, period. And, and Helene, do you agree with that, or do you, are you part? Well, in a shelter, we do use buprenorphine for, medica for um, pain. Pain, transmucosally. Yes. I 100% agree with that. Sorry about and that, yeah. Sedation. Probably better, yeah. And the reason I say buprenorphine is not a great drug analgesically for surgery, but what we're finding is that um, with the ampules, with the cost, with the problem logging it out, what you're gonna pay for to get that theoretical advantage, which we now know doesn't weigh out practically, is not gonna be a lot. And I'm not saying go back to Torb. Keep your buprenex, as we said, for maybe transmucosal use for cats. And in cats, it does seem to be a great analgesic for your chronic medical cases, pancreatitis, is upper respiratory. I mean, you have a lot of different uses for it in the shelter situation. But surgically, it might be an issue. We've been using the sustained release. SR, yep. Yes. Yes. Oh my God, they are happy, happy, happy cats. Happy. And for URI cats, it's like if we have to anesthetize a number of URI cats, it's almost as if they wake up. Better. And they don't have URI anymore. Like they just, I don't know if their throat, their larynx, their head. Thank you. Really yeah. Up. But it's, it's amazing. And it comes in a high enough strength that if you're using insulin syringes, it's reasonably priced. Priced. Does Zoofarm make that up for you? Yeah. So the sustained release buprenorphine supposedly lasts for two to three days. Um, and it's a nice drug. Um, I think the caveats that we've seen, some shelters have a lot of upper respiratory, just endemic. And um, there is a fever that can be in, induced by this drug. So if you already have cats with fever, a lot of fever, you give this drug, they get another fever on top of that. 107 is a hard fever to get rid of for three days. Just be cautious of that. And the other caveat, I think, is that the label dose of that, try using 50%, because you'll get just as happy a cat and just as long of a duration. I think the label dose is probably about a point, um, 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg. And I just use the average old buprenorphine dose of 0 0.02 mg per kg, and you get really nice analgesia on that in your medical cases. I don't, I don't use a lot of that surgically, but I do appreciate the use of that. Yes? What about morphine in this cocktail? Are you worried about the vomiting? 
Yeah, there is a couple of, of morphine protocols on this too. Um, if, if we did use morphine in this population, um, it's funny, if it's given IM in a really good muscle, i.e. cranial quadriceps muscle, you will not see that vomiting in dogs. In about 20 to 30 percent of cats, you're still going to see some vomiting. Now, vomiting can be um, an upsetting thing for people around the patients. I'm not sure as it's, it's as upsetting for the patient because it truly gets rid of a lot of, of junk that we don't know is sitting there in their stomach. Um, so I do think it works well. Uh, I know my hospital switched from butorphanol to buprenorphine because I'd be more concerned about the duration of analgesia. So can you comment? Is buprenorphine indeed lasting longer than butorphanol? <coughs> It is. It is lasting longer. And again, it's a theoretical analgesia. I think we're probably getting somewhere between 6 and 12 hours of analgesia with buprenorphine. And 12 is an outlier. 10 is probably more realistic. And butorphanol, the analgesia, about an hour to 2 max. Yeah, combining the two together um, can get us up to about 24. And that's a lot of Sheila Robertson's work. Helene. Have you seen hypothermia by using Dex, Med, Ketamine, and Hydro? I have. Yeah, the hyperthermias um, I think happen a lot and much more in a shelter population because we just have, you know, and they're stressed, it's warmer, the humidity's higher, they aren't breathing well, there's upper respiratory. Um, and the hyperthermias are pretty scary with some, some of the narcotics. So hydro's been one of them. The ketamine, high dose ketamine above like a three mg per kg ketamine can induce that. And the sad situation is that they're pretty severe fevers, and if you have the sustained release stuff, it lasts for two to three days. So that's two or three days of sub-Q fluids in a fan and cooling their pads and no paper, and they, they don't feel good. Um, I don't think we see it as much as we used to because there, there's more regulation around the byproducts that we're using to make the opioids, but we still do see it. Yes? Get rid of, could you lose naloxone to reverse naloxone or neostigmine? You can. The problem is the half-life of naloxone, probably about 50% that of the drug, and, and if that, um, and you need to keep giving it. So unlike atopamazole, which will reverse dexmedetomidine and last a lot longer, naloxone reverses it and then goes away in maybe about half an hour. So you need to keep giving it and keep giving it. A lot of people do give it sub-Q. Butorphanol is a great reversal agent. I hate to say that, but it's a great reversal agent in and of itself. Helene. Um, it seems like in the past, I mean, I was taught butorphanol had great visceral analgesia, but it seems to, there's now some papers who say it doesn't have much yeah. analgesia at all. So I wasn't sure what your thoughts With were on that. With butorphanol. Yes. The question was, does butorphanol provide visceral analgesia? Yeah, the earlier papers looked very promising on that. They were kind of poo-pooed for a while, and, and now some of them are back. I think it really depends on the setting. And I, I also think combined with dexmedetomidine, any of the opioids are better drugs. So it's very hard to dictate what's giving the visceral analgesia. I mean, large animal people, Christy, tell me if I'm wrong, they use it quite a bit still. It's, and and um, it does seem to have I quite a good analgesia. I was we're using it more for sedative effects. For example, I'll use it 100%. Combined, yes. But as a post-op, yes. analgesics, I won't use it. Before. Yeah. A lot of people use it right now for a true um, procedural sedation. In combination. In combination with something. Um, it's also a great reversal agent. A lot of people, um, you know, we have animals that have, are on CRIs or maybe hospitalized for a few days on a narcotic, and they're just nauseous. So we give them butorphanol and they eat. It's a great anti-emetic, too. So it stands, stands to prove that there's some value to it. Yeah, the, the, for cats with, um, with these cocktails, you do not need a post-operative dose of anything. I normally will give a non-steroidal um, intra or post-op to these patients, and by and large, we use Medicam or Carprofen um, in both cats and dogs, sub-Q. Um, you certainly can use the newer Onsi, or you can use the older Ketoprofen. You can even use aspirin. Um, there's you know beauty to that, too. But, that's about all you need. You don't have any additive, post-operative hydro need or fentanyl patch or nothing like that. So they provide very good surgical and post-operative analgesia. Is the anti-medic dose the same? For the, for the, for the, for the, for the, 
So the bupro this is buprenorphine. Yep. The antiemetic dose of butorphanol is a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 mg per kg. So that's our post-operative um, and our anti-nausea dose of butorphanol. And I, again, I don't use it for a lot of pain relief around times of surgery because I do not think that it provides something in and of itself for surgical pain. But combined with dexmedetomidine, combined with the right drugs, it's definitely a good agent. I just want to get on to a couple of those protocols. Um, there's been use of dexmedetomidine just as a pre-med. So let's just say you're getting into this and you want to use this as a pre-med for your patients. Definitely helpful to go ahead and reduce your ketamine and propofol. Um, nice paper out that shows it can give you just 25 minutes of OVH. And certainly, there's a lot of combinations that you can find um, in the shelter situations <laughs> combined with other agents that just give you a little bit extra to your pre-med. Let's say right now you're using a pre-med of ACE and TORB, and you're thinking, oh, I don't like the ACE droopy eye wobbliness. I want to get away from that. These are the doses that I would say you need to combine with your TORB to start getting going. And, it, and it, all it means is that you're going to use less ketamine val, less ketamine in of itself, less propofol when you go ahead and keep these animals under, less SIVO and ISO. The idea with a lot of our injectable regimes is that we're trying to get you guys away if you're doing high numbers per day, i.e. 20s to 40s numbers of spays and neuters, from not intubating as much and from not using a inhalant. Now, are you wrong to intubate? No. You can intubate very nicely on these protocols. Are you wrong to put the animals on ISO and SIVO? No. You can go ahead and do that, but you're going to use less. As long as we extend their head, make sure they have a patent airway, as long as we go ahead and monitor the animals appropriately, once you take away the intubation in the machine, it's amazing how much morbidity and mortality you remove from mass volume surgery. I, I know it sounds crazy, um, but that's the trend when you're talking about high numbers of animals. If we're talking about one patient, intubating them and being ready for an ABC airway breathing cardiovascular, that's the way to go, no question. You're talking about doing 30 of these a day. You better be darn good at intubating those patients because you might be causing a lot of trauma. Yes? I think it's fairly well accepted to mass cats for um, the I think it's less accepted for the dogs. Is that something you think is changing? Or? I, I think I would try to avoid mask inducing patients and mask maintaining patients. You know what? Not so much for your own health because it affects every one of you guys. And you don't realize this until you start living in an environment where you got headaches all the time and your muscles start aching and you're going home and you're not thinking correctly. Um, it's amazing how much a mask can add to pollution for you guys. But also, it's pretty bronco-irritating and sympathomimetic for your patients to be on a mask. Because when the nasal and ocular receptors get that inhalant gas, it's irritating, and the irritation is inflammation. And you know what, you guys need one more dose of inflammation on top of upper respiratory than, you know, like a hole in the head. Now your cats are already suffering with that crap, so get away from it. Those are the cats that probably, if you need something, you need to intubate them. So I don't think masking is needed, and I, I wouldn't advocate it at all. Now, let's say you have 10% of your patients per day that need a little something extra. Are you wrong to put a mask on their face? No. But if you start getting up to where you need to mask animals for maybe 20 to 40% of your patients, change your protocol. Make it safer for you. Make it safer for your patients. So you would do a heavier induction dose of the, the these cocktails? Um... Yes. Yep, I do a heavier pre-med. That's really the key. So I combine agents together in a pre-med so that we need, we have staying power with these injectable regimes that you're not going to need to add little things like a little more propofol, a little more ketval, a little more mask. Yes? Do you guys shift your technicians in the surgical suite into a paradigm of reducing that masking when that's kind of what everyone's used to? Is it worth just not, like doing a full setup and just running straight oxygen, or is there so much residual ISO? Like, is that, are you really reducing the irritation factor? By just adding ISO? By, by removing the ISO. Removing ISO. On a patient-to-patient basis, but if you're using the same tubes, are you with the vaporizer not on. 
So the question was, with vaporizer not on, is masking with just oxygen harmful? No, it, oxygen, um, there's not enough residual in the system to make the animals or you feel badly. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. How often? How uh, important is the oxygen support? You're going to find that out by your pulse oximeter. And you know what's funny? Your pulse oximeter is going to work better without oxygen, without 100% oxygen. I don't know if any of you know that, but think about your oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay. Pulse oximeter and 100% oxygen environment. So the animal's intubated on an on oxygen flow of one to two liters a minute. That pulse oximeter is always going to read well until suddenly, you know what? It doesn't. And guess what? It's almost too late. Okay? But if we don't have the animal 100% oxygen, the pulse oximeter is much more reflective of the appropriate oxygen status of that patient because we're on the exponential part of the curve. We're not on the top. Um, and so pulse oximeters, uh, believe it or not, work a lot better and not 100% oxygenated animals that are healthier under anesthesia. And another important thing is oxygen vasodilates. And most pulse oximeters have a lot of trouble reading when the animals are vasodilated on high inhalant and high oxygen. Helene? Between metatomy and dexmetatomy, um, we've been going back and forth due to cost yes. at our shelters. So my question is, your talk is mostly in dexmetatomy. That's what we're using. Due to cost, we went back to metatomy. Yes, and yeah. So my question is, how does it correlate drug-wise and side effects? I mean, dosage-wise and side effects between the two. Yeah. Th so many shelters can't afford Dexmed. They use compounded metatomidine. Um, in some countries, metatomidine is still available. Um, I think it's a great drug. In fact, I like it better than the dexmedetomidine. How does it compare dose-wise? There are differences. Roughly, metatomidine anywhere from 1 to 1.5 times higher than your Dexmed. And in terms of duration, metatomidine will last longer and be more sedating in its effect. I think it was actually a better drug. I'm sad they took it off the market. But you know, in order to take it off the market, they came up with the dexmedetomidine. And dexmedetomidine is just one isomer, one half isomer of metatomidine. Yeah. Um, so it stands to hold. It's a good drug. Yeah. How about vasoconstriction? Like we use mostly pulse oximeters, yeah. or anesthesia. Yeah. And Uh, we're fast, so instead of putting EKG and all that, we end up having vasoconstriction, and we actually have issues reading with, with pulse oximeter when it's so vasoconstricted. With metatomidine. Yes. Metatomidine and dexmetatomidine will both cause problems with your, some of your monitoring if they're in high dose, and I think that's a key. Try, try backing your dose down. If you have trouble monitoring your patients, try backing your doses down of both those drugs and ketamine a little bit. But I'd, st I'd start off with the dexmetatomidine and metatomidine. Yeah, yes. Um, what's the implication of using the cocktails in longer procedures? Uh, we do a lot of combination surgeries. Animals can do more than one thing. They may need a spade. Nucleation. <laughs> yeah. Um, for, I would say if you're going to do maybe over an hour of surgery, um, i.e., maybe an hour and a half on your average, um, maybe a fracture repair, maybe an enucleation, a mass removal is probably not going to take you that long. If you're going to do over an hour and a half, you're probably going to have to intubate those patients and put them on ISO and SIVO. Now, you're not going to need as much. Yeah. Um, in terms of pain relief, quality pain relief still. In fact, the doses that I've given you are probably going to give about an hour and a half to three hours worth of pain relief, surgical pain relief, to dogs and cats. So you're going to have enough to do the average procedures you would do in a practice situation. Uh, I have been taught that with these, with these cocktails like TTDX, Kitty Magic, that they are actually hypoxic. Uh, and you're, it sounds like you're saying something different. So what kind of, what, with that pulse ox on that camel, what are you considering okay? Yeah. So the original thought on these combinations, especially the thought with xylazine, was that you are going to end up with a hypoxic animal. And theoretically, yes. And practically, yes, you probably were, especially at the manufacturer's recommended dosages. What we have found over the last five years is that by modulating the dose, i.e. reducing the dose of dexmedetomidine and metatomidine that are in these mixes and cocktails, and combining them with other agents that are supportive, i.e. ketamine's cardiovascular supportive. It actually pushes heart rate and opens up vessels a little bit. 
um, that we don't get as much hypoxia. Now, will you get some? What you're going to get is the hypoxia characteristic of any type of general anesthesia. The cyanosis that people saw years ago, i.e. blue mucous membranes and, and white mucous membranes on some animals, was due to the higher dose of dexmet and metatomidine and the vasoconstriction that, that they got with those. And what happened is with the vasoconstriction and a slow heart rate, the circulatory time through the tissues was slower. Was the tissue hypoxic? No. Was the vasculature hypoxic? Probably. So we don't see as much of it as we did. Yes? Yeah, um, no, because the, the bitorphanol is a very short-lived analgesia. And a lot of the recent work on the combining those two opioids together, um, the B opioids, buprenorphine, bitorphanol, haven't classically been thought of as good opioids. But combining them together increases the analgesia and probably lengthens it. So it was a theoretical thought a while ago that you'd be interacting with receptor levels and bouncing each other off and we just haven't found that to be practically true. Yep. Yeah, it, it's a well-known fact. It's not even that you see it. And the reason it is is that the, the chickadee requires 1,000 micrograms per kg. Okay, and the hummingbird, 10,000 micrograms per kg. The tinier the animal gets and the higher their metabolic rate and their body surface area ratio the higher dose they're going to require. Puppies and kittens will require higher doses than adult animals. Cats, higher doses than dogs. So it's a, it's a truth, it's a fact, it's the way that those drugs work. And um, there's nothing you can do about it, really. It, but that's, cats are going to, on average, require two to four times more than a dog would. Yeah, again, it's not, it's not about the height, the increasing dose. It's about how they metabolize it and their body size. And I know it seems crazy, but, um, you know, here we do horses and cows and sheep and goats and, you know, hummingbirds. And it's amazing how much dexmedetonin the hummingbird will take compared to the elephant or the llama. And not a lot you can do about that. Is there worry? No, because it's more about a metabolism of the drug. So it's a really good question. I'm glad you guys brought that up. Yes. Is there a heart rate lower limit that you do introduce an anticholinergic? I mean, if they get down in the 40s, do you start to get a little concerned? Yeah. Yeah. Here's here's really. Thank you for asking that question. I'll wind up on this. Is you know people low ask all the time. I'm so worried about a heart rate that is so low. How low can it get? You know, if you are watching your manual signs of anesthesia, i.e., your jaw tone your ocular positioning, your pupil size. If you are watching your pulse ox and they're good, the heart rate can get down um, to about a third of what it's normally at in a resting animal situation and be fine, be fine. Now, when the animal's sleeping at night, that's usually where it gets, believe it or not. Our chihuahua goes down to a heart rate of 70. Our Great Dane goes down to a heart rate of 30. Needless to say, we don't have that Great Dane when he's sleeping at night on isoflurane, and we're not having blood loss, okay? But we are monitoring that patient. And if we're looking at those signs and they're okay, we let them be. Um, is there any active hemorrhage? Is there sign of deterioration? And when I say active hemorrhage, we're not talking about spay neuter, you know, little skin bleeds. Maybe we got an ovarian pedicle that's oozing a little bit. We're not talking about that. We're talking about major vascular bleed. Maybe we hit the spleen, we can't stop it. Um, you know, for surgeons here, it's like hitting the popliteal artery. Um, maybe a nucleation, we're pulling the eye out and we actually have a huge bleeder. Then what we're going to do is what we do for any anesthetic. You have a low heart rate you're worried about, lower your inhalant and warm your patient up. Those two things are going to get you mileage in terms of saving that animal. Lower your inhalant and warm the patient up. That's the first thing you do. If you're really worried, what I usually can do is go ahead and give a low dose of glycopyrrolate. Um, and it's hard for people to get away from this, but 
you know, the average dose of glycopyrrolate, we were taught 0.01 mg per kg glyco. We don't need. We can get by with maybe a 0.003 to 0.005. Really low. Okay, you can give that IV, you can give it in the tongue. If you really want, you can give it IM. Okay, that will help increase the heart rate. That, why don't we give it with the dexmedetomidine? If we give it with the dexmedetomidine in the same syringe, it's kind of like turning up the water uh, faucet and stepping on the hose at the same time. Okay, we're increasing the heart rate and with the dexmed, vasoconstricting. So the increase in the heart rate is turning up the water with the anticholinergic like atropine or glyco and the dexmed stepping on the hose. Sometimes we see those little spurters and, and we start to see the hose have an aneurysm. That's what happens in our heart and our vessels, our kidneys, et cetera. So that won't happen if we give those temporally, meaning time-wise, separate, different, distantly. Last question. No, no. And you guys are probably really quick at your spays and neuters. So no, there's not. I mean, we, there's no set heart rate that I'm worried about because what I'm watching, I could take blood pressure and pulse ox out of the picture, out of the picture. I could be out in the woods of, you know, I don't know, Afghanistan doing this. And what I'm looking at is jaw, tone, eye position. I'm looking at the manual signs of anesthesia. If I'm worried, then I lower my ISO if I ever had any. I warm the patient up if they're not warm. Um, I go ahead and um, give glycopyrrolate. It's not a problem giving that. Um, the other thing is you can partially reverse this drug. You can give half of the reversal agent. And the reversal agent for dexmedetomidine is atopamazole. It's the same volume as you give dexmedetomidine, but I hate to reverse them because you know what? I bring back pain, I bring back stress. The animal, sometimes the reversal is so sound, the animal gets off the table and they leave and you know, you have the last suture to put in. Um, so I try to just partially reverse them, but you can do that. And on average, we give them maybe a third of the reversal agent. But people, this is probably the most common question I get is, I'm really worried about the heart rate. How low do I let it get? And what I say to them is start to embrace a bradycardia. It's, it's hard, it's really hard. I mean, we were trained here, many of us 20 years ago were just thought to try to you know, think about atropine, glycopyrrolate, high heart rate, safe, and now what we know is anything but that. And atropine is basically a CPR drug nowadays. Glycopyrrolate's used surgically, and the reason being is atropine is so, so potent, so drying, so harmful. Leave it for the cases that don't have any other way out. Um, it's, it's also very stimulating, and sadly enough, some of our patients get more stimulated with it, i.e. lab animals, cats. Um, and they get, it's really hard when you're stimulating an animal, you're trying to get it to sleep at the same, same time. So, All right, I'll finish there, but thank you guys so much, and this has been recorded, so hopefully you'll have these. <laughs>